Hello there. A warm welcome to you for this Daily Bible Reading Podcast number 7. Today we read Genesis 13 and 14, Job 7, and the first part of Mark 5. At the bottom of the notes for this podcast, I have included information about features of the YouVersion Bible Reading app. Take a look at that if you are new to using that app, as I will not read that text in this podcast. Let's prepare to read Genesis 13 and 14. In yesterday's reading, we heard about God scattering people by confusing their languages. Incidentally, it's important that you remember that the city that they were building is called Babylon. Then we trace the ancestry of Abram, and I pronounce his name Abram in the podcasts, who descended from Seth's line. Then we read about the call of Abram and what happened when they were staying in Egypt because of the famine. Say, Abram doesn't sound like a model husband, does he? Genesis 13. Abram went north out of Egypt to the southern part of Canaan with his wife and everything he owned, and Lot went with him. Abram was a very rich man, with sheep, goats, and cattle, as well as silver and gold. Then he left there and moved from place to place, going toward Bethel. He reached the place between Bethel and Ai, where he had camped before and had built an altar. There he worshipped the Lord. Lot also had sheep, goats, and cattle, as well as his own family and servants, and so there was not enough pasture land for the two of them to stay together because they had too many animals. So quarrels broke out between the men who took care of Abram's animals and those who took care of Lot's animals. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were still living in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, We are relatives, and your men and my men shouldn't be quarreling. So let's separate. Choose any part of the land you want. You go one way, and I'll go the other. Lot looked around and saw that the whole Jordan Valley, all the way to Zoar, had plenty of water, like the Garden of the Lord, or like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord had destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the whole Jordan Valley for himself and moved away toward the east. That is how the two men parted. Abram stayed in the land of Canaan, and Lot settled among the cities of the valley and camped near Sodom, whose people were wicked and sinned against the Lord. After Lot had left, the Lord said to Abram, From where you are, look carefully in all directions. I'm going to give to you and your descendants all the land that you see, and it will be yours forever. I'm going to give you so many descendants that no one will be able to count them all. It would be as easy to count all the specks of dust on the earth. Now go and look over the whole land, because I'm going to give it all to you. So Abram moved his camp and settled near the sacred trees of Mamre at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Genesis 14 Four kings, Amraphel of Babylonia, Ariok of Elassar, Kedoleomer of Elam, and Tidal of Goim, went to war against five other kings, Bera of Sodom, Birsha of Gomorrah, Shinab of Adma, Shemeber of Zeboim, and the kings of Bela, or Zoar. These five kings had formed an alliance and joined forces in Sidim Valley, which is now the Dead Sea. They had been under the control of Kedor Leomor for twelve years, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled against him. In the fourteenth year, Kedoleomer and his allies came with their armies and defeated the Rephaim and the Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in the plain of Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the mountains of Edom, 
pursuing them as far as El Paran on the edge of the desert. They then turned around and came back to Kadesh, then known as En Mishpat. They conquered all the land of the Amalekites and defeated the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. Then the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela drew up their armies for battle in Sidim Valley and fought against the kings of Elam, Goim, Babylonia, and Elasar, five kings against four. The valley was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to run away from the battle, they fell into the pits, but the other three kings escaped to the mountains. The four kings took everything in Sodom and Gomorrah, including the food, and went away. Lot, Abram's nephew, was living in Sodom, so they took him and all his possessions. But a man escaped and reported all this to Abram, the Hebrew, who was living near the sacred trees belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. Mamre and his brothers Eshkol and Aner were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew had been captured, he called together all the fighting men in his camp, 318 in all, and pursued the four kings all the way to Dan. There he divided his men into groups, attacked the enemy by night, and defeated them. He chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus, and got back all the loot that had been taken. He also brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions, together with the women and other prisoners. When Abram came back from his victory over Kedor Leomer and the other kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in Shave Valley, which is also called King's Valley, and Melchizedek, who was king of Salem, and also a priest of the Most High God, brought bread and wine to Abram, blessed him, and said, May the Most High God, who made heaven and earth, Bless Abram. May the Most High God who gave you victory over your enemies be praised. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the loot he had recovered. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Keep the loot, but give me back all my people. Abram answered, I solemnly swear before the Lord, the Most High God, maker of heaven and earth, that I will not keep anything of yours, not even a thread or a sandal strap. Then you can never say, I'm the one who made Abram rich. I will take nothing for myself. I will accept only what my men have used. But let my allies, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, take their share. Let's turn to Job 7. Today we hear the second chapter of Job's response to Eliphaz. And of course, there were no chapter divisions when this book was written. However, as we number it today, in chapter 6, Job said, If I knew God would kill me, I would leap for joy, no matter how great my pain. I know that God is holy. I have never opposed what he commands. And he also complained, In trouble like this, I need loyal friends, whether I've forsaken God or not. But you, my friends, you deceive me like streams that go dry when no rain comes. And his three friends were only warming up to the criticism they would give. In desperation, Job says, All right, teach me. Tell me my faults. I will be quiet and listen to you. Honest words are convincing but you are talking nonsense. Job 7 Human life is like forced army service, like a life of hard manual labor, like a slave longing for cool shade, like a worker waiting to be paid. Month after month I have nothing to live for. Night after night brings me grief. When I lie down to sleep, the hours drag. I toss all night and long for dawn. My body is full of worms. It is covered with scabs. 
pus runs out of my sores. My days pass by without hope, pass faster than a weaver's shuttle. Remember, O oh God, my life is only a breath. My happiness has already ended. You see me now, but never again. If you look for me, I'll be gone. Like a cloud that fades and is gone, we humans die and never return. We are forgotten by all who knew us. No, I can't be quiet. I'm angry and bitter. I have to speak. Why, O oh God, do you keep me under guard? Do you think I'm a sea monster? I lie down and try to rest. I look for relief from my pain. But you, you terrify me with dreams. You send me visions and nightmares until I would rather be strangled than live in this miserable body. I give up. I'm tired of living. Leave me alone. My life makes no sense. Why, O oh God, are people so important to you? Why pay attention to what they do? You inspect them every morning and test them every minute. Won't you look away long enough for me to swallow my own spit? Are you harmed by my sin, you jailer? Why use me for your target practice? Am I so great a burden to you? Can't you forgive my sin? Can't you pardon the wrong I do? Soon I will be in the grave, and I'll be gone when you look for me. And turning now to Mark 5. We completed the one and only parable chapter of Mark yesterday. Following the parable of the mustard seed, the disciples and Jesus took off to the other side of the lake. Jesus slept soundly in the boat while a storm was raging on the lake. And then he calmed the storm. Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. Jesus and his disciples arrived on the other side of Lake Galilee in the territory of Gerasa. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, he was met by a man who came out of the burial caves there. This man had an evil spirit in him and lived among the tombs. Nobody could keep him tied with chains any more. Many times his feet and his hands had been tied, but every time he broke the chains and smashed the irons on his feet. He was too strong for anyone to control him. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. He was some distance away when he saw Jesus, so he ran, fell on his knees before him, and screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus was already saying, Evil spirit, come out of this man. So Jesus asked him, What is your name? The man answered, My name is Mob. There are so many of us. And he kept begging Jesus not to send the evil spirits out of that region. There was a large herd of pigs nearby feeding on a hillside. So the spirits begged Jesus, Send us into the pigs and let us go into them. He let them go, and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news in the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who used to have the mob of demons in him. He was sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the man with the demons and about the pigs. The people asked Jesus to leave their territory. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had the demons begged him, Let me go with you. 
But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how kind he has been to you. So the man left and went all through the ten towns region, telling what Jesus had done for him. And all who heard it were amazed. Before praying, I would like to make a comment. We have heard again in this story about demons. Here is my perspective. Demons are not just mental illness. They are real spiritual forces. They have to do with the fact that Satan fell and took with him a large number of angels, which have become demons and evil spirits, or also called unclean spirits. We can't erase demons from the pages of Scripture. Here's what I've seen in my experience working both here in the United States and in Indonesia. Where demons are worshipped, they come out in the open to further manipulate people and to produce even greater fear. But where demons are not believed in, they're happy to work in the background where they have become very adept at manipulating people's thoughts. We see in this story Jesus' complete control over the forces of darkness. We are not to fear them. We are not to pay attention to them. The New Testament tells us that we have spiritual armor to protect us against the attacks of Satan and his forces. And now let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, thank you for your victory over the forces of darkness. And that victory is the one that you won on the cross. That was your ultimate victory. The interchange with the demons in this one called mob shows us that the demons know that they will be punished. They know they are on the losing side. And when you command them to leave, they must leave. And Lord Jesus, the Apostle John tells us that greater is he who is in us, meaning you, Lord Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world, meaning Satan and his forces. Lord, I pray that we would not be like the people of that region. At this point, it seems that they would have been happy to have the pigs and to get rid of you. Lord, we choose you. We pray that you'd be close to us and protect us from all spiritual forces. And let us follow the example of this man once he was healed. He went all through his region, telling the people how kind and loving you had been to him.